Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll try to start this presentation with a manly image and without smiles at all. Um, trucks, Chinese trucks in, in Tajikistan. It might be a strange presentation to start with because I'm talking about presence without encounters, uh, the pending futures and the Chinese non-engagement in the Tajik Pamias. The Chinese presence in the Tajik Pamias is a paradox. On the one, one hand, you have China is Tajikistan's largest investor and second largest trading partner. Chinese trucks use the Pamir Highway on a daily basis to ship goods from Kashgar to Dushanbe, and Chinese mining companies are actively prospecting in the Pamirs. On the other hand, China is strangely absent in the lives of, of all but a few, and actual encounters with Chinese people remain rare and brief. While there is a road link to China via the Kulma Pass, there are no Chinese restaurants or shops in Murgap, Horok, or Ishkashim, and one is more likely to meet a Chinese on the street of any European city than in the Pamirs. In other words, the Chinese presence in the Tajik Pamirs is largely devoid of actual day-to-day -day encounters. Nevertheless, China plays a major role in discussions about the region's potential futures. China's influence is conjured up in new Silk Road dreams and potential large-scale investments in mining and infrastructure. These Chinese futures are sometimes anxiously anticipated and seen as ultimately inevitable. Sometimes they are played down as mere rhetoric and fantasy. They remain opaque, ambiguous, and always pending. My aim in this paper is to examine these pending Chinese futures and offer a possible explanation of how this situation came into being. I start with an account of the first international economic forum held in Khorog in 2013 to discuss the rhetorical presence and ambiguous absence of China. I then turn to the particular post-Soviet history of the Tajik Pamirs um, <coughs> in order to find uh, possible explanations. In the third part, I will look into prospecting as a mode of non-engagement that reinforces the ambiguity and opaqueness of Chinese presences in the Pamirs. I will raise, finally, the question how to understand a presence in the context of absent or rare encounters. At the end of 2013, uh, at the end of August 2013, the, the first international economic forum took place in Horok. The goal was to bring investors to the region and particularly to the Ishkashim Free Economic Zone. The zone was formally established already in 2010. However, the Tajik government did not provide sufficient funds to establish basic infrastructure. The zone's management was thus actively looking for investors. More than 200 participants came to the two-day event in Horok. Special helicopter flights were organized from Dushanbe, and when I arrived at the conference center, the parking lot was full of these expensive white SUVs adorned with the logos of development organizations and NGOs. A conference kit in an Isle of Pamir's bag was handed out to the participants. It included a number of, of concrete investment proposals, ranging from mining to tourism and, and medicinal herb processing. The main asset of the zone, as advertised during the forum, lies in its strategic location between China and Afghanistan. In 2013, with the US Army on the way out of Afghanistan, with Chinese enterprises actively looking for investment opportunities abroad, and with all the talk of new Silk Roads, the idea of a free economic zone halfway between Kashgar and Faisabad, bypassing China's all-weather all friend Pakistan, seemed a very promising idea. On the second day of the event, a site visit was on the agenda. A convoy of vehicles brought us to Ishkashim, about three hours from Khorok. I was sitting next to the regional director of a major international development bank and asked him about his take on the zone. It's a bold plan, he said, adding after a pause, but we need bold plans. The vision of a possible future, however, uh, stood in stark contrast to reality. The designated zone itself was merely a large field of stones between the dusty road that leads up to the Wakhan Valley and the Panch River that marks the border to Afghanistan. Standing on this rocky plain of aspiration, we were listening to uh, the zone's director, Aydibek Bekmurodi. Uh, with much enthusiasm, he appealed to our imagination to see the zone's potential that was just waiting there to be harnessed by foresighted investors. However, as it became clear over the course of the forum, there were hardly any investors present. Most of the forum participants were representatives of development organizations and NGOs. 
and local government. The Afghan and Pakistani delegations had to cancel their visit due to visa issues, a reminder of the practical difficulties of, of crossing borders that was quite in contrast to the rhetoric of transnational <coughs> economic development at the forum. Strikingly absent was also were also the Chinese. Apart from a small delegation of three representatives from the embassy in Dushanbe, which I initially mistook as trekking tourists, there was no Chinese presence at all, despite the overarching imaginary of a future in which China plays such an important role. Asking around why no Chinese were present at the forum, people raised their shoulders. Some speculated that it was, may simply not have been opportune to, to invite them. While China is an integral part of the imaginary of a prosperous future, it is also a sensitive issue. Discussions about China frequently turn to the larger geopolitical issues at stake. The fact that the Tajik government ceded territory to, uh, to, to China in the process of border demarcation, for example, is still widely, uh, widely and, and harshly criticized. This skepticism against Chinese engagement is also directly tied to the large-scale projects Chinese companies are typically associated with, first and foremost in mining. The deputy minister of the, of the Tajik Ministry of Economic Development and Trade, chairing the plenary session at the forum, made his stance very clear. He said that he was skeptical about those who, who come to develop Gornobarakshan with Mendeleev's table of periodic elements in one hand. Potential Chinese investment is rarely thought of purely, purely in business terms. It is always conceived of being part of larger schemes. So far, the Chinese presence in the Tajik Pamirs has remained rather a matter of rhetoric and imagination than actual encounters. The question is how this situation came into being. Tajikistan had, without doubt, a difficult Soviet post-Soviet history. Shortly after independence, the country descended into a devastating civil war that lasted until 1997. The Pamiri of Gornobadakhshan sided with the opposition, and, had, and that has not been forgotten in Dushabi until the present day. While Tajikistan was mired in civil war, however, other parts of the former Soviet Union bordering China, China experienced the gradual process of opening up. In the borderlands of Kyrgyzstan, of Kazakhstan, of Siberia, day-to-day -day exchange with China began to reshape local Local economies and people's aspirations. Around the turn of the, of the millennium, the bazaars of Bishkek, Irkutsk, or Ulanude were bustling with Chinese traders selling cheap Chinese consumer goods. While anti Chinese sentiment was always an implicit feature of this era of new contact, it offered also an economic niche for those with the skill and will to engage in the China trade. During this first phase of revived cross-border relations between China and Central Asia in the 1990s, business was characterized by small-scale shuttle trade. This trade was often in the hands of local borderland populations, like the Dungans, as we're going to hear later, for example. This initial phase of intensive contact laid the basis from which many of the current cross-border business relations evolved. By contrast, no such thing happened in the Pamirs. The Kulma Pass between Murgab and Tashkurgan was opened only in 2004, and trade was never in the hands of local shuttle traders. The beginning of the Kulma trade coincided with the end of the era of shuttle trade between China and much of Central Asia. While several shopkeepers in the bazaar of Murgab told me that they initially had traveled to, to China to establish business, business relations, the amount of red tape and the relatively small volume of goods sold on local markets in the Pamirs rendered direct contact with China unprofit unprofitable for most local traders. There are several reasons for this. First, there is much mistrust against border minorities. In the case of Tajikistan, this mistrust directly stems from the role Gornobadakhshan played in the civil war. In the case of China, there is the fear of insurgency and cross-border terrorism, especially since the events of 2009. Both Dushanbe and Beijing would rather see trade in the hands of well-established uh, professional companies than informal uh, small-scale shuttle traders. Second, as there was no previous phase of shuttle trade between China and Tajikistan, there is also no history of informal relations at the Sino-Tajik border. And third, both Chinese and Tajik citizens need visas to cross the border. There is no border pass regime that would allow uh, people living close to the border to cross easily. Visas must be obtained in Dushanbe and Beijing, and this involves a lot of, of, of money and time. These three factors together offer an explanation of why trade is largely in the hands of professionalized log logistics companies and requires little day-to-day -day interaction. The sealed Chinese 60-ton trucks just pass through the, the, the Pamirs on their way to Dushanbe, and the drivers are predominantly Tajik from outside Gornobadakhshan. 
Chinese goods sold in Murgab and Horog are either first transported to the markets in Dushanbe and then brought back to the Pamirs, or they are imported to Kyrgyzstan, where informal border arrangements both between China and Kyrgyzstan and between Kyrgyzstan and, and Tajikistan are well established. A similar kind of presence without encounters is also characteristic for Chinese mineral exploration, to which I will now turn to. Mining in the Pamirs, of course, has a very long history. It dates back at least to the 9th century. And the vision of the Pamirs as a realm of precious minerals has long been a crucial factor in imaginaries of the region. However, the contemporary mining industry in Tajikistan is so far predominantly focused on locations outside the Pamirs. In Gornobadakhshan, international mining companies have limited their engagement to preliminary prospecting. The case of Bazar Dara, uh, the 11th century silver mine, shall illustrate this mode of engagement and the Chinese role in it. Since 1995, the exploration rights for this silver mine have changed hands half a dozen times. In 2007, the prospecting rights were purchased by a subsidiary of Kaskamis, the Kazakh cop copper miner. Soon, however, Kaskamis came to the conclusion that the deposit was not of sufficient scale to de develop. They tried to sell it. In early 2015, a Chinese company finally acquired the rights, but during my visit in August 2015, the future of the mine was still up in the air. The remaining Pamiri staff, a foreman, very much a Nastayashi Mujik, a couple of workers and a, and, and a driver, um, they were very unsure whether the Chinese would really take over and whether they would be able to keep their jobs. A few weeks prior to my visit, the first Chinese delegation had come up to Bazar Dara to take stock of the equipment and inspect the tunnels and mining camps infrastructures. Uh, the Pamiri staff remembered their visit with a fair amount of humor. Communication was very difficult as the delegation's translator did not speak any Tajik and only very basic Russian. The Pamiri, completely unaccustomed to, to dealing with Chinese, were not sure what to expect and what was expected from them, how to make them feel comfortable and what to cook for them. The Chinese delegation did not take any risks in this regard. They came fully equipped with uh, instant noodle soups and tinned fish in fermented soybean paste, which the Pamiri found very difficult to stomach. This was the first thing uh, the Pamiri foreman told me, and he made no secret of his prejudice. The Chinese were loud and rude, he said, uh, and they had no manners and no respect for their surroundings. Surely they would not take care of the camp and destroy everything they had spent so much effort to build and maintain. The foreman and his crew um, would much rather work with a European or a Russian or a Kazakh company. This is where we belong, the foreman stressed. At the same time, however, the staff also had much respect for Chinese economic development and Chinese work ethics. If there was a future for the mine, they all agreed, it was probably a Chinese future. After their visit, the foreman drove the Chinese delegation to Dushanbe, and on the way, they were caught in the devastating landslide that blocked the Pamir Highway near Barsim in, in summer 2015. The foreman led the Chinese guests up a steep mountain slope to circumvent the lake that was building up. He helped them cross the river using a rope. Um, he carried the small and slender Chinese on his back. At one point, standing on top of the ridge, his guests started taking pictures, and he feared that they would be blown away by the wind, and with them, the mine's future. This encounter against the backdrop of a Chinese presence that is usually devoid of encounters is characteristic for the entire situation. Mining is shrouded in a cloud of, 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 of secretive dealings, baroque, baroque holding structures, opaque responsibilities, and uncertain futures. In this sense, prospecting is emblematic uh, for the mode of engagement here. Symptomatically, it was not e I was not even able to find out the name of the Chinese company that uh, was taking over Bazar Dara. The, the Pamiri staff did not know, and the deal had not gained any media attention. With all this limbo on their minds, the staff focused on the more concrete challenges at hand. Provisions for the winter were to be acquired, and, and, and the satellite TV, bringing entertainment and world news to the, this little cabin on leaf springs during the winter, needed to be repaired. Hopefully, the Chinese would be able to help at least with that, they said. These anecdotes harbor a larger question, namely, what we mean when we talk about the Chinese presence in the countries and regions of the former Soviet Union. How to understand a presence without or with rare encounters? I would argue that in the context like the one at hand, a presence can even be amplified by the absence of actual encounters and the opaqueness of the few that do, place, do take place. 
prospecting as a mode of non-engagement fits this picture very well. In summary, the, seek, the point I seek to make is very simple. The Chinese presence in the Pamirs is an outcome of a particular contemporary conjuncture. High level rather than day-to-day -day encounters, prospecting rather than actual mining, grand future schemes rather than actual exchange. In such a context, rumors abound and the Chinese presence becomes even more shrouded in ambiguities and opaqueness. It is at once present in public debate but hidden from public negotiation. Part of this conundrum are the legacies of the civil war and the late start of Tajik Chinese relation, relations. Part of it are the political tensions in Xinjiang and the Chinese red tape in response to them. And part of it is the inherent logic of big schemes involving elites from, from the centers of China and Tajikistan rather than local entrepreneurs. In this context, presence without encounters and pending futures keep reinforcing each other. Thank you very much.